Okay, so we're going to start with this very interesting seminar. It's going to be Miguel Pato, that he's postdoc in, in Stockholm in the Oscar Klein Center. And he's going to talk about the mapping dark matter in the Milky Way. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much for the invitation, for the opportunity to be here in Valencia for the first time. And also for the opportunity to see some sunshine in the winter, it's undervalued sometimes. Um, and I, I'm going to talk about the dark matter distribution in our own galaxy, the Milky Way. And uh, I'll give you a little bit of what has been done and what will be done in the, in the next few years. And I'll touch a bit upon the, the history of the subject. This will be very physics, uh, our sort of physics oriented. I know that most of you probably are particle physicists, theorists, um, not necessarily working on dark matter. I also see a couple of experts in the field, so I'll try to do a pedagogical introduction to the subject, but I'll try not to bore the experts in the, in the room. So let's see how that works out. Okay, the evidence for dark matter nowadays is very, very rich and very broad. It comes from different probes, including big bang nucleosynthesis, an isotropy of cosmic microwave background, large scale structure of the universe, and then dark matter is also identified in the individual dwarf galaxies, galaxies, and clusters of galaxies. So, as you can imagine, I don't have time to focus on all of these, nor the expertise to do so, so I'll focus on the galactic scale, and in particular, I'll focus on the, on the Milky Way. Okay, so this is the outline of my talk. I'll start with a very brief historical perspective on the evidence for dark matter in the galaxy, and for that I'll, I'll focus on another very special galaxy, the Andromeda Galaxy, which is the closest spiral galaxy to ourselves. And this uh, will basically set the stage uh, for talking about the case of the Milky Way. And here I'll give you a little bit of a tour of the galaxy and indicate what are the data that we can use to trace the different components. I introduce a little bit the methods used in the literature to constrain the dark matter distribution in the galaxy. And finally, I present uh, some of the latest constraints on the dark matter profile. And here I'll be a bit biased and talk, talk mainly about my, my own works, but I'll try to, to set it in the context of what has been done in the, in the, late, uh, in the latest year. And then I'll discuss a little bit the future directions and the prospects train better dark matter uh, distribution in our own galaxy. Okay, so the evidence for dark matter has mounted throughout the 20th century. The first very few uh, very early remarks on the possibility of, of dark material contributing to the dynamics of our galaxy happened in the 20s by people like Jakob Kaptein and Jan Oort. Then, as you probably know, in the 30s, Vicky has hypothesized the existence of huge amounts of dark matter in the coma cluster of galaxies by studying the velocity dispersion of, uh, of, of, of the galaxies in that cluster. And then we have dark matter found in spiral galaxies by many authors and with a very big boost in the 70s, but also other people have contributed throughout the years uh, to that effort. And finally, in the latest decades or so, dark matter is also found to be very important at cosmological scales also by many authors. So as I said, I'll focus mainly uh, on galaxies, and in particular on spiral galaxies, uh, which has been contributed, as I said, by, by many authors. So just to set the context, let me give a step back and remind you of the classification scheme of galaxies introduced by Ebel in 1936 and depicted here in this figure. So to the left, you have basically the so-called elliptical galaxies that are smooth and spheroidal galaxies classified according to their ellipticity and then we have spiral galaxies here that are disc-like and have spiral arms there are two branches, a normal branch and a barred branch where in the barred branch you clearly see a bar in the center of the galaxy our galaxy is a spiral, um, a barred spiral galaxy in between these two types here then in between ellipticals and spirals you have so-called lenticular galaxies that are basically an interpolation between these two groups and then you have galaxies that are completely lack uh, symmetry now the evidence for dark matter in galaxies comes from individual objects in basically all of the groups, mainly ellipticals and spirals here I'll focus uh, on the most um, interesting case if you want on the most interesting case of spiral 
uh, galaxies. And to do so, let me focus on a very special galaxy, the, the, the Andromeda galaxy, also called M31, which is the closest spiral galaxy to ourselves, 800 kiloparsecs from us. And actually, you can see it on the, on the night sky, if you have very good eyes, or Mac. Uh, I don't have any of that, but... Um, so the, the best way to learn about the mass of uh, uh, sorry to, to learn about the mass of an astrophysical system or astrophysical object is to study its kinematics. And in astrophysics, kinematics can be studied, for example, by measuring the Doppler shifts of, of particular spectral lines in a given region of the galaxy. Talking about spectral lines like the 21 centimeter line of atomic hydrogen, CO line, carbon monoxide, uh, like other molecular lines, and so on. And the idea is very simple, you measure the Doppler shift uh, of uh, these spectral lines and this will give you an indication of how fast this region of the sky is receding or approaching uh, from you. And in the case of Andromeda, the, the kinematics has been studied since the 30s. The, the very first person to study this was Horace Babcock, already in 1939. He measured the Doppler shift of emission and absorption lines in the gas of the galaxy. And he used this to uh, measure the rotation of Andromeda uh, around the, the, the center of the galaxy. And what we found is depicted here in this plot. So this is the rotation velocity as a function of the angular distance from the center. And you have here a couple of dots. So we found very high, uh, surprisingly high velocities of rotation velocities uh, across the galactic plane of uh, uh, Andromeda. Uh, and these are very high velocities of order of hundreds of kilometers per second, which is very high in astrophysical uh, terms. And already in that paper, he noticed that to support this kind of uh, very fast rotation, you would have to have large mass to light ratios. So quite a lot of mass uh, in, the, in the Andromeda galaxy. And he pointed to the possibility of being contributed by some kind of dark material. It was not dark matter at uh, that uh, Considered dark matter at that time, but he already pointed to to that uh, possible link. However, a confirmation of this hint has waited quite a few decades. There are several people working throughout the, these decades, but the big boost came in the 1970s when Vera Rubin and Ken Ford measured the shifts of uh, ionized hydrogen, so H alpha line, across uh, Andromeda, and with the same kind of procedure, they determined the the, the rotation curve of the galaxy. And they found a more or less flattish uh, rotation curve that rises steeply in the beginning, but then basically stabilizes at a value way towards the, the outskirts uh, of the galaxy. This was later confirmed also with other data with 21 centimeter line from <coughs> atomic uh, hydrogen a couple of uh, years later. So just to put things into context, this is what um, Barker managed to observe. Rubin and uh, Ford then they corroborated the fast rotation of Andromeda, not exactly to face value, and they find this kind of flattish rotation curve I was talking about. And the reason why this is important and why I'm talking about this here is that the bulk of the visible matter in the galaxy is concentrated here in this red box over there. So under Newtonian gravity, you would expect that the rotation, uh, so the velocity just falls in a Keplerian way in this uh, form here, much like the velocity of planets falls with, uh, with the inverse square root of the distance uh, to the sun. And this is obviously very much at thought uh, with observations and it is uh, what is behind the argument uh, for the evidence of dark matter in spiral galaxies. This was just the case of Andromeda in the 70s and in the 80s and this behavior was also observed with similar kind of data towards many other spiral galaxies and this gave uh, a lot of um, support to the idea of dark matter at the galactic scale. Right, this was my uh, very short introduction on the, on the topic. What I'll do in the next few slides is to focus on uh, our own galaxy, uh, the Milky Way. And here, as I said, I'll start with a bit of a tour of the galaxy. What is there that you should know, at least for, for the purposes of this uh, talk? And in first order, you can just think of the Milky Way as a complex system of stars, gas, dust, and dark matter. And there are a few components that I would like you to, to keep in mind. 
First of all, in the very center of the galaxy, there's a supermassive black hole, 4 million solar masses. We know this by studying the orbits and monitoring the orbits of very, uh, very fast stars, very close to the black hole. They all have elliptical orbits, and the focus of all these ellipses coincides with, with, the, with the black hole. You can determine this kind of mass. Now, this is extremely important if you are interested in the galactic center. I'll be interested in distances of a few kiloparsecs off the galactic center where the gravitational influence of this guy is um, very negligible so I won't be talking about the supermassive black hole anymore then the inner 2-3 three, three kiloparsecs of the galaxy uh, are dominated by a so-called stellar bulge so a bulge of stars in the galaxy this bulge has a, a very clear bar shape that's why our galaxy is a bar spiral galaxy and it has a mass of around 10 to the 10 solar masses, just to give you a, an order of magnitude. Then we have a disk of stars that is usually decomposed into a thin component and a thick component. Um, it has a scale length uh, of several parsecs, it extends to 10 kiloparsecs or so. It's also a marked spiral structure uh, and has a total mass of around 10 to the 10 uh, solar masses, so similar to the, to the boat. Then we have gas in molecular, atomic, and ionized um, forms, mainly hydrogen, but also IP around ones. And this gas has a very patchy, complicated distribution that I show here in the very inner part of the galaxy. But at larger, at larger scales, um, it is basically a disk-like structure, also with a spiral path, pattern as the, the, the stellar disk. And to give you an order of magnitude, the mass, uh, the total mass in the gas in our galaxy is about a factor 10 less uh, than the, the mass in the stellar disk. Now in all of these the Sun and the solar system are around there, around 8 kiloparsecs from the galactic center and the Sun is traveling in a more or less circular orbit around the galactic center at a velocity of around 120 kilometers per second. Now these are just numbers for you to keep in mind, they are uncertain uh, as of today but it's good to, to have an order of magnitude. Now, to support this kind of fast rotation of the galaxy, we, we need a putative dark matter halo extending several hundreds of kiloparsecs and with a mass of at least 10 to the 12 solar masses. So the dark halo is actually the, the, the most important contributor to the or mass component of the galaxy. But actually, from the observational point of view, we don't have much information about the, the intrinsic properties of, of this halo. And I'll, I'll come to that point in a in a second. So there you go, you have the, the galaxy whose total gravitational potential. Yeah. <coughs> Just a question on, uh, on the velocity of the Sun. Uh, is the, the velocity of the Sun around the center of the galaxy compatible with the absence of dark matter or, or really you need a huge amount of dark matter to explain this velocity? So I, I'll go quantitatively on that question in, in a few slides, but at the, the, the position of the Sun we need some dark matter. I'll quantify in 15 slides or so. Um, okay, so there you go, you have your galaxy with a total gravitational potential that has a contribute from what I'll call the variance from here on, so normal matter, the bulge, the disk and the gas, the contribution from dark matter. And the question is of course to know, um, uh, to know how can we constrain the parameters of any given mass model of, of the galaxy. And uh, the answer is, of course, with data. And here I classify data into two different groups, kinematical data that will trace the total gravitational potential of the galaxy and therefore the left-hand side of this equation. And uh, here we have rotation curve tracers, star population tracers, if you are interested in the, in the, um, in the say, not so outer part of the galaxy and then you have the kinematics of satellites if you are interested more in hundreds of kiloparsecs or also timing arguments in the local group and then we have what I call here generically photometry that will trace the individual baryonic components so the first three terms in this equation over there on the right hand side and here you have star counts, luminosity maps micro lines in the case of the bulge, emission lines in the case of the gas and, and so on so what I'll do in the following is just to, to focus on each of these types of, uh, of data uh, very, very <coughs> briefly. And I'll start with uh, photometry. 
Well, let me start also with the inner part of the galaxy, what I call the, the stellar bulge, that dominates the two straight kiloparsecs, inner kiloparsecs of the galaxy. So this has been observed mainly by optical and infrared uh, surveys. And they all agree in, in, in that the bulge has a triaxial shape with a so-called bar, which is basically the major axis uh, towards uh, the left of the galactic center so we are here, the galactic center is there and the near end of the bar is towards positive longitude so the, the left of the galactic center, so this much is consensual but then the actual profile, the dimensions of the bulge and its inclination are not precisely measured from, from the data so what I show here in all these details that are not important but just to convey uh, the information that, the, I mean, the message that from the data point of view we cannot find a precisely a precise profile, a precise dimension, and also precise inclination uh, of the bulge. And this will infer, of course, will uh, imply, of course, um, a big modeling uncertainty uh, when modeling the stellar bulge, and it will also affect the other uh, the other components. So I want you to keep this in mind because uh, I'll use. Uh, later on. So there is an important uncertainty on the modeling of variants in our galaxy. Coming to the third, this, this has been observed uh, or um, model or constrained by optical surveys, most uh, most prominently STSS, the, the Sloan Sky Digital Survey. It is usually decomposed into a thin component with a scale height of around 150 parsecs and a thick component usually uh, modeled with a 750 um, uh, parsecs of uh, skylight. Also here different profiles also fit equally well the data. These are not simulation or theoretical models, these are based on observations. And also here therefore there will be a modeling uncertainty um, pertaining to the, to the stellar disk. Finally we have the gas. Molecular gas can be traced uh, most efficiently with uh, the, the CO line, the carbon monoxide line, which I, I show here. The atomic hydrogen can be traced by 21 centimeter line. Ionized hydrogen can be uh, traced by age of lines, for example, also the dispersion measures of, uh, of pulsars. As I said in the beginning, the inner part of the galaxy has a very complicated gas distribution in the inner 10 parsecs or so. Fortunately for my case here, uh, this can be just assumed to be a point-like distribution, just have to know the mass of this gas. Then in the inner two kiloparsecs there is some structure, there is a central molecular zone that has to be modeled, the whole disk uh, and so on. And at larger scales there are also molecular ring and some contribution of uh, specialty atomic gas. So, but the take-home message is here in this plot. So in terms of gas context of our galaxy, the inner part of the galaxy is dominated by the molecular uh, the molecular hydrogen, and in the outskirts we mainly have uh, atomic hydrogen. While the ionized uh, gas contributes uh, little, let's say, to the, to the gas content of the galaxy. So there we go, now I introduce a little bit the three-dimensional distribution of the variants in our galaxy, the bulbs, the disk, and the gas. And with this three-dimensional distribution we can, um, we can calculate their dynamical contribution to the rotation curve of the galaxy. That's what I show here in terms of rotation uh, velocity as a function of distance to the galactic center. And what I show here in blue are the different bulge models I introduced before. There are seven. Those are the blue curves. The, the disk models are shown in green and the gas models, the two gas alternative models, are shown in black. These are all observation based uh, models. So if you are interested in knowing what is the total contribute of parents to the rotation curve of uh, our galaxy, you pick your favorite blue curve, your favorite green curve, and your favorite black curve, and you add them in quadrature. So you already see the problem here. There are many ways to do this. To be more specific, there are 70 different models that you can construct with this, and they will induce uh, a baryonic bracting uncertainty. It all will carry along the, the top. Miguel? Yes? So is this um, the average velocity or is it, are you assuming a spherical potential? No, I, this is uh, the, the velocity average over a circle in the galactic so it's, plane. So it's average. Yeah. 
because some of these, I mean, not all, but some of these models are triaxial. Good. That closes the discussion for photometry. Let me now focus on kinematics. I don't have time to go through all the, the these probes, but I want to focus on, on the, the first and the second. So let me start with the rotation curve stress. So the rotation curve, if you will, is just a proxy for the for the radial derivative of the total gravitational potential, which under spherical assumption is just tracing the, the total mass enclosed within a, a given radius. So this is a useful proxy to, to have in mind to, to analyze the rotation curves. Now, in some external spiral galaxies, like this one here, that are towards a very convenient line of sight that is not blocked or, or, or dust absorbed, etc., and with a very good inclination angle, you can use data like the 21 centimeter line to probe the rotation curve very, very precisely, therefore infer the total mass of the galaxy and try to play the game of decomposing this total mass into the different visible, not visible components. This is great, very useful, but in the case of our galaxy there's not much we can do. We are inside the galaxy, inside the star disk. It's very, very difficult to measure precise distances and precise velocities to gas, to stars, to regions of the galaxy. And the situation looks more or less like this. We have huge error bars, we have systematics at play, and so on. So it's a difficult uh, uh, problem. I don't want to be too pessimistic, um, and therefore I'll, I'll just say that it is still uh, possible to constrain the rotation curve. And the way it goes is almost always the, the same. There is the sun, there is the galactic center, we are here in the plane of the galactic, of the galactic plane. And the idea is to observe an object, and to try to determine the distance to this object, which is a very difficult problem in astronomy. Uh, and also to try to determine its velocity along the line of sight, for example, with Doppler shifts. Then you can write this very simple geometric equation that you can try to invert to get the velocity, the uh, rotation velocity of the galaxy at the galactic centric radius of this object. And this gives you a point on your uh, rotation curve diagram. You repeat two different objects along different lines of sight, and you have uh, your rotation curve. So this is the the basic way it goes. There are many details, but it's the, the idea. To do that, as I said, you need uh, to be able to measure the line of sight velocity. You do this with Doppler shifts of, of spectral line. In the case of the gas, you can use C, the, the carbon monoxide line, edge of lines, 21 centimeter lines. You can also use a bunch of, of lines in stars or stellar atmospheres. And you can also use um, um, molecular lines in so-called misers, where there is stimulated uh, emission of, of, uh, of molecular lines and happens in some regions like in high mass star forming uh, regions. Then you have to be able to tell at which distance uh, this object is. In the case of the gas you can use, and this is actually a, a difficult problem uh, in astronomy, uh, astronomy with uh, important uncertainties. For the gas under certain conditions you can use terminal velocities. For stars you can uh, do some photospectroscopy and compare to star models. And in the case of masers, for example, you can use parallax measurements, which are the most model independent and sometimes the most reliable measurements of, of uh, the distance. So what I showed here was until recently one of the most um, complete compilations of rotation curve data in our galaxy. Uh, but actually there are, there are many data sets missing there, so a big part of our job uh, here was to try to improve upon this compilation and try to put together uh, um, uh, a virtual decompl or the, the most complete compilation of data that we could do and we collected all of this data that I, I mean the details are not very important for this talk, I just want to show that we uh, divide this in gas kinematics with terminal velocities from H one CO, which to reach and giant molecular clouds also start, and also misers that in the recent years have been very important because from these objects we have 60 dimensions. So we know the 3D position and we know uh, the 60, the, the 3D velocity of these guys with transverse and radial uh, velocities. And just as a parenthesis, I'm uh, working together with Fabio Yoko to uh, release this data to the public for you to select the data that you want, treat it, and put it on your dynamic model. Um, might be uh, interesting for some of you. And this basically uh, sets my
total gravitational potential. So this is a compilation of data that we put together. It's optimized between 2 and 20 kiloparsecs. It's very messy. There are around 3,000 data points. And this is going, as I said, to fix the left-hand side of that equation there. Now, the first thing that you want to do is to try to compare this, coming to uh, your question. But before answering it, let me just give you a flavor of what is behind the star population tracers and how can we use them to, to trace the total gravitational potential. So in a galaxy like our own, or like other galaxies as well, star encounters are very, very rare. rare. So they do not happen very, very often. So if you have a star, an average star, this will fill the <coughs> average smooth total gravitational potential of the galaxy and not so much the gravitational influence of the neighboring star. So if you have a test of carefully selected stars, you can treat them as a collisionless gas, write down the collisionless Boltzmann equation, take the first momentum and have the so-called genes equations. Let me put here in Cartesian coordinates. So the, the genes equations just relate if you want to uh, space derivatives of the total gravitational potential with the velocity dispersions of a given set of stars in that part of the, of the galaxy. And this is a very powerful method to constrain the total gravitational potential. It has been done in, in several different uh, directions, if you will. Uh, it has been done with stars in the halo of our galaxy, constraining the potential between 10 and 60 uh, kiloparsecs, for example. It has been done across the disk, above and below the disk has also been done above and below the galactic disk at the solar uh, position. Okay, so I introduced a bit the kinematical data, the photometrical data. Now the key question is how can we combine the two to infer the dark matter uh, or constrain the dark matter distribution. And for this there are basically two types of uh, methods. We have first of all local methods where you use uh, the data from a given patch of the sky to derive the dynamic steering. And I'll go to details in a second. This is assumption free in the sense that you don't have to model the galaxy as a whole. But with the data that we have, we have today, uh, it usually leads to low precision results. A robust, at present, they are mainly low precision results. Then you have global methods, where the idea here is a bit different. You try to use data across the galaxy to derive the dynamics elsewhere, for example in the solar neighborhood. Here you clearly have to model the galaxy as a whole, you have to come up with a mass model of the galaxy and try to constrain its parameters. Uh, because we have quite a lot of data um, across the galaxy, you can uh, have high precision results, but you always have to worry about uh, system methods. Now these are just uh, very incomplete lists of references for all of these two models. Uh, two methods and um, what I'll do in the following is to try to give you a little bit of the flavor of local methods and then focus the rest of my talk in, in global methods. So I already shown part of uh, this slide here, uh, the genes equations. What you can do is to couple the genes equations with a, with a Poisson equation and here you can relate the total mass density in a given region of the sky or of the galaxy to the derivatives of the potential that can be related to the velocity dispersion of stars in that part of the galaxy. So this is a very powerful method to wait to find out the mass or mass density of the galaxy across different um, regions. And you can apply of course this to the galaxy and the cylindrical symmetry, you get this more or less complicated equation. I don't want to talk about the details, I just want to show you the, the most simple limit of this kind of equation, the so-called Oort limit, where you look at stars that uh, are at the solar neighborhood and go uh, in vertical direction above and below uh, the galactic uh, plane. In this case you get this very simple equation, so you relate the total mass density in the solar neighborhood uh, with derivatives of the velocity dispersion of these stars in the vertical direction. So I, as you, I mean, once you have the total mass density, you can subtract off what you think the bearings contribute to get a measurement of the local dark matter density. And this is a quantity that is very important for dark matter in itself and dark matter searches as well. So as you can see already from this formula, this guy depends on the double derivative of a quantity that is difficult to measure uh, from, from astronomical data. So it's not very surprising that results um, in this kind of technique have been 
quite huge. So errors have been quite huge. There has been a lot of improvement uh, lately. Uh, but, but this is a, a, a difficult problem and I just want to point out that we, this will be uh, something to keep an eye on in the next five years with further data that will come online and that I'll talk towards the, the end of, the, uh, of my presentation. Okay, now I'll focus a little bit on global methods and I basically already told you the, the idea. So you have the rotation curve that will trace all the matter in, in our galaxy. You have an idea of how the baryons are distributed in the galaxy and therefore their contribution to the rotation curve that I depict here in green and then the difference between these two guys can be used to constrain the dark matter distribution in our galaxy. Um, so the first thing that you can do is to compare these two plots that are already shown just to see um, where do the variants contribute the most and, and, and feel which distance? That's what I show here. So the red data points are just a rotation curve date in a slightly different quantity there. And the gray band is the bracketing of all the baryonic models that uh, you can construct with the models I, I talked in the beginning of the talk. Uh, and you can see that, so okay, at very large distances, uh, dark matter is very much needed in our galaxy. But that's not much the, the focus of this plot. This can be done also much better with other tracers. Here I want to assess the discrepancy between the total rotation curve and the contribution by variance. Um, and to see until down to which radius can you tell apart these two components. And you can see it already by eye that the slopes are quite different. And you can see a discrepancy down to 5 kiloparsecs. You can also do a, a proper statistical analysis and um, test these against all kinds of systematics in, in terms of astrophysics, data selection, the, the uncertainties on galactic parameters, and, and so on. But at this point, perhaps some, so, some of you are, are asking, okay, so what, there is dark matter? And of course, the next step that one can do is to try to use uh, these data to constrain the dark matter distribution in our galaxy. That's what I'll, I'll try to talk about in the next few uh, slides. And just to put it simply, the, it, it, it's a very simple idea, of course. Uh, you have the dark matter profile, it's a function of radius, perhaps with a couple of different parameters. You calculate the contribution of this profile to the rotation curve. You add in the variance, you fit to the data, you get some confidence regions in your parameters of your profile. So this has been done by everybody. It's a very well-motivated uh, approach. These are some of the latest results uh, with different data, with different approaches, and mainly focused on the so-called local dark matter densities, so the dark matter density in the solar nebula that usually happens to be around 0.4 GeV per centimeter cube. We did this same kind of analysis with the data I've shown before in the talk, with the rotation curve data, and also uh, with these baryonic modelings. And I'm showing here the results of the two sigma uh, confidence region for a uh, so-called generalized Navarro Frank and White dark matter profile in the perimeter space of the inner slope of this profile and the local dark matter density. So you can see that you can measure the local dark matter density with quite high accuracy or statistical error at least and it happens to be around 0.42 GB per centimeter cube. There's not much difference uh, using a Navarro Frank and White or an ASTO profile. Now, the thing is that this has been done for one representative baryonic modeling, so one way to combine these three different curves. If you do for the other 69 uh, models, you have this uh, blob shifting up and, up and down, left and right. And this induces uh, uh, systematic uncertainty on the, on the determination of the local dark matter density that is quite uh, important. It's even more important to determine the inner slope. Now, one neat thing of this plot is that uh, it has a lot of information. One of that information is actually that the, the, the shift on the horizontal direction is very much degenerate with the disk that you pick for the galaxy, which is easy to understand. So if you pick a more massive disk, you'll need uh, a smaller um, local dark matter density to fit the same rotation curve. So that's the degeneracy in the, in the, the horizontal direction. In the vertical direction, you have a degeneracy with the, the bulge that you pick for, your for the galaxy. So 
So if you have a more concentrated bulge, that is the region that dominates in the center of the galaxy, you'll need a less spiky profile um, to, to fit the same rotation curve. So just to be fair, this was done for a fixed distance to the galactic center and a fixed local uh, circular velocity um, of, the, of the sun, or actually the local standard of rest. Uh, as I said in the beginning, these are uh, values that are reasonable in line with current observations, but there are uncertainties there. We can use, for example, the, the, the orbits of S stars in the very center of the galaxy, also the proper motion of the Sagittarius A star, which is uh, this, the radio source at the center of the galaxy, to derive uncertainties on these parameters. And if you do so, just for the representative baryonic model, model that I showed, you basically have this blob shifting uh, in this direction. So there is quite some uncertainty on the local dark matter density due to this galactic parameter uncertainty, not so much on the on the inverse law. Right. You can do the same kind of thing uh, with modified Newtonian dynamics and uh, deliver constraints on modified Newtonian dynamic theories. In the interest of time, uh, uh, I'll skip this, but you can ask me if you want. Uh, and this is basically the cartoon that I showed you before which is great, everybody has done it and it's very well motivated but at a certain point when we have better and better data from rotation curve I would hope that we can break this kind of uh, assumptions on a functional form of a dark matter profile and let the data tell us which profile of dark matter do we have in our galaxy so what I'm proposing here is basically to invert this cartoon start with the rotation curve data, subtract the variance and get the dark matter contribution and then try to invert to the, to, the, to the profile of our galaxy which is uh, not an immediate, uh, an immediate uh, step as, it, as the inverse is so this is basically breaking the assumptions of a functional dark matter profile and try to let the data tell you um, what the profile of our galaxy of the dark matter in our galaxy actually is so just as a proof of concept we, we uh, um, we apply these for spherical dark matter distributions, the simplest case, but can be done in non-spherical geometries as well. And basically you have to solve this relatively simple uh, equation. And in the end you can write down the dark matter density with a contribute from uh, the dark matter this the dark matter contribution to the, to the rotation curve and its slope. So the take-home message here is basically that the rotation curve at a given radius tells you about how much mass is enclosed within that radius while the slope of the rotation curve at a given radius has information about the density uh, of the dark matter profile at that radius ok, um, and note here that there is no assumption whatsoever on the profile of the galaxy so we apply this uh, with the data I've shown you before, very conservative uh, approach so the, the, the results are not spectacular or so uh, but and we cannot really tell apart different uh, profiles but this is mainly to keep in mind for the data that is about to come in the next 5 to, to 10 years so I think this is a, an important way forward in the, in the field in the, in the next few years right, that uh, leads me to, to future directions so I presented a little bit uh, the advantages and disadvantages of local and uh, global methods in principle, what I would like to have in the future is local methods everywhere. This would be great. Unfortunately, we are not quite there yet. And one of the reasons we are not quite there yet is because of uncertainties. There are huge uncertainties that are preventing us uh, from having a more precise knowledge of the dark matter distribution in, in our galaxy. And this is a plot that I like to show that shows the relative uncertainty uh, of the dark matter contribution to the rotation curve as a function of radius and then you have different contributions from the rotation curve data itself from the normalization of both this and gas, the baryonic components and also from baryonic uh, modeling so the different ways you can construct baryonic uh, models and you very clearly uh, see that in the outer galaxy kinematical uncertainties are the most important and baryonic uncertainties are dominant in the inner part of the galaxy this is um, this is very expected because baryons are most important in the inner part of the galaxy okay? and these are basically uh, the, the uncertainties that I showed in this plot here and kinematical uncertainties here 
So if we want a more precise dark matter distribution in our galaxy, we need to kill off these two sources of it. And fortunately there, is, there are plenty of experiments, satellites and, and surveys out there that will be able to help us out here. I just want to point two of the most important in my opinion. First of all is Gaia. Gaia is a, as a satellite that has been launched already in 2013, has been started collecting data uh, in the summer of 2014 and it is supposed to, to observe a billion stars. This is more or less 1% uh, of all stars in our galaxy, mainly local stars, and will deliver very precise astromet astrometry and that means uh, very precise parallax and, and proper motions, very precise photometry and very precise spectroscopy that will allow very precise uh, measurements of the radial uh, velocity. It's an opt optical telescope and uh, it will be very important in terms of what I talked in this talk, uh, in this presentation for modeling the disk of our galaxy, for the local dark matter density and also for the so-called Oort constants that basically um, set the, the local circular uh, velocity. Then we have Apogee 2 here. This is a, a, a ground-based um, observatory with telescopes in the south and north hemisphere. It, uh, it is in the infrared, so it can see deeper into the center of the galaxy. And will complement uh, Gaia, <coughs> especially in terms of radial velocity uh, information. It will be very important to study the bulge because in principle it can see further down uh, the line of sight of the galactic center and also eventually study the kinematics across different uh, regions of the galaxy. There are also other <coughs> um, other experiment satellites and so on on the further uh, down the line. Now just not to leave it completely gener general, I, I want to focus on something I'm working on um, since a few months ago and this is to try to derive some prospects for Gaia to measure the so-called Oort constant. Oort constants are these A and B, and these are just <coughs> simple combinations of the local circular velocity and uh, its slope. And the neat thing is that if you look at the velocity along the line of sight and the proper motion, so the transverse velocity of stars in the, in the solar neighborhood, you can write down uh, these velocities just as cosines or sines with the prefactor given by this Oort constant. So if you look at this data, you can see these kind of uh, shapes. You can fit to these uh, Oort constants. This has been done, for example, here with Iparcus data. Iparcus is basically the predecessor of uh, Gaia. And here one could uh, have um, more or less 5% accuracy in this, in, in this, in this kind of uh, uh, of measurements. Gaia, however, will improve a lot Pony Parkos, so we are now in the, in the process of trying to, to estimate how much better and Gaia that will be starting to, to be released uh, in 2016. Not all of the data, parallax data, so it will be interesting to see how this field improves. And this is very important in itself, it just sets the, the local circular velocity, but it has also Im important implications for for dark matter, for the dark matter determination, sorry, for the determination of the dark matter density in the solar neighborhood, and eventually also for the direct detection of, of dark matter. And that's it. That brings me to, to my final slide. So uh, I'll talk. A, I, I talked a little bit about the photometry and kin kinematics. So how we can use photometric data in our galaxy to track baryonic model, more matter to use kinematics to track the total matter in our galaxy and how we can combine the two to derive constraints of dark matter presented a little bit local and global methods why are they important and how are they complementary and I also pointed out some of the of the biggest uncertainties that we are playing now and that that are actually preventing us from from a better understanding of the dark matter distribution in the galaxy and I'll just finish there by saying that uh, the distribution of dark matter in the Milky Way is still unconstrained as of today, but we have lots of data there, and hopefully this data will lead to a new precision era in mapping dark matter in our galaxy up until the, the end of the decade. That's it. Thanks. Some questions, comments?
in, uh, when you were presenting, I mean, the profile of the rotation curve of Andromeda, I mean, in a slight manner, I think. I mean, in the in the in the low in the in the first part, I mean, for for low values of rho of r, you have this structure. I mean, uh, why 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 do we have this this structure for this rotation curve? So you mean the data points or the the, the data points? Yeah. Yeah, for, yeah. I mean, this this first peak that uh, yeah. also you shown later. I mean, so these are not data points. Um, ah, okay. But I then, mean, but then you have them. I mean, also in the data points. Yeah. Oh. yeah uh, I'll go there. So um, the thing is that the the rotation curve, as it is derived here, it assumes circular orbits for for the gas. And in the very center of galaxies like Orion or Andromeda, the the gas orbits are not uh, are. are are not circular, and it skews, kind of skews the the, um, the the velocity. So this is why you you have this kind of peak structure. So the lines here are a model for the galaxy, and you basically have two components, uh, or actually three. You have a bulge and a disk, and also a, a halo, uh, and this is basically the bulge uh, part here. But you shouldn't interpret at this very low. Um, radial distances, you shouldn't interpret this as uh, a circular velocity because there's no circular orbit there. So I'd be very careful in trying to, to, to make something up. Okay. More questions? Uh, the first one is, uh, okay, you have, you have shown that uh, you have a certain amount of dark matter within the sun and the center of the galaxy. and. Uh, Numerically speaking, I didn't uh, see, uh, or perhaps I was uh, not careful uh, listening, um, which is the amount of dark matter that you need. Is, uh, is it in the same ratio as uh, on cosmological grounds or yeah, so much less? You mean inside the solar yeah. circle? In, yes, between, between the, the sun and the center. Yeah. It's, uh, so seven times uh, as baryonic matter? Or like no. No, but I mean, uh, in terms, it is, I don't have a number for you, but it is comparable to the mass that the baryons contribute in the same region. So it's of course not the, the same as in cosmological standards, but of course there's much, comparatively speaking, there's much more mass uh, outside the solar circle. So you, if you want to compare with cosmological values, you should yes. just go up to quadratic kiloparsecs and count. And there, uh, I didn't talk, I mean, it was not the focus here. And there, I think the, the ratio is not too different. I mean, there's the, the, baryoni, the, the missing baryons problem, etc. but it's also not clear what is the total mass of the galaxy. There's a, an uncertainty of at least a factor. Well, we always, in astrophysical, always say a factor two, but it's kind of a factor two there. And then the second question is, if you go to smaller scales, like uh, star to star or in the solar system. Can you also track uh, existence or not of dark matter? Or? So in principle, yes. In practice, I mean... Have you seen... I mean, no. In, no. In practice, there are upper limits, but uh, there are... I mean, these kind of, uh, of densities I'm talking about here in the solar system are irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Completely irrelevant. So, at least just from, you know, gravitational physics, it's... There is no hint of any dark matter. There's no hint, at and the distance I don't think like there's a, much so. hope to, to have any... So, I mean, the, we know, the planets follow the Keplerian orbits with the mass of the Sun as it is. And the there's no, no evidence for diffuse dark matter in, in, the, in the solar system whatsoever. Fine. Okay. I mean, it depends on which densities you are interested in, but uh, the upper limit for my standards is very, very, sorry, the upper limit is very, very high. Mm -hmm. Fine. More questions? So, so you showed the, the uncertainties of the local density, so, and then you, you played around with the, if you, if you add these uncertainties here, you, you, you move these ellipses, but you didn't show what is the overall uncertainty when you put everything in. Uh, so is that a, yeah, that, is that a question? I mean, yeah, that's I didn't question. What is the uncertainty? <laughs> <laughs> so it's this uh, here, you, but then, yeah, but then, for instance, uh, when you add the, the uncertainty on the on the distance to the center, that uh, moves, uh, that that brings an uncertainty. Yeah, so, 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 so
Yeah, I mean, I didn't, uh, I didn't quantify it, but I mean, I wouldn't say it's it's less than what is shown here. So between 0.35 and 0.55 or something. We didn't. Um, I mean, I, I didn't want to to show a precise statistically defined value because this is very systematic. Well, maybe not the center, but like the range. Yeah, the, okay. The, the range you can see also this in the in the in the paper. I mean, the thing is that this is the range for one baryonic model. But if you relate this baryonic model, then I would say between 0.4 and 0.6. Yeah, but then you added uh, also in the previous uh, in the previous uh, slide here you added uh, different baryonic models. So my question was if you add everything in okay if, if you want to work for me with a super 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 cluster i mean they, these are our data that as we did it they, they are very computationally intensive so the, the the technical reason why we didn't present it was because of that you can kind of eyeball uh, what you mean what, what i mean there probably if you have a baryonic modeling here you have a range that is between 0.45 and 0.65 uh, yeah, more than a, a very rough range, I, I cannot quantify it. Oh, and what do you write uh, RS equal to 20 there? Because it's fixed to, to 20 kiloparsecs. So then I don't understand. This is, uh, this is a two parameter uh, profile, right? So if you fix one, you, are only, you only have one parameter three. I'm, I'm confused. No, it so depends on the concentration NF of the. Well, you are doing NFW, right? Yeah. No, I'm doing. Uh, well, yeah, I'm doing a generalized NFW, so I'm leaving the inner okay. scope free. Okay. Okay. So that's why, yeah, it's not yeah, really yeah, yeah. NFW, yeah, 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 yeah. alpha, beta, gamma, whatever. It's three parameters. I mean, this, yeah, yeah, yeah. Three parameter. this is in line yeah. with uh, yeah. we, with the concentration that we think our Milky Way is okay. from simulations, but it, it's not well measured. That, that would also add some. So, uh, other questions? Uh, I have a question yeah. in the sense of how is the the triaxiality entering the room? I mean, the sense, for instance, some, we know that some baryonic matter follows the, the spider's arms. How this, because you have baryonic that are accumulated in some sense, they are kind of bound state, then maybe the velocities are not so... We are not modeling the spiral arms. So this is like the average only. Yeah. This is an average, uh, so it, it's triaxial, especially in terms of the bulge, but the disc uh, and the gas, we didn't, um, it was in hour to do the list, but we still didn't. Do. So what the density that depends on on the on the spiral arms. And, mm. uh, but do you think It's also not sure we, which model, I mean, okay, one could try to use a couple of different models for the spiral arms, if there are two or four spiral arms, if there are logarithmic, etc. Mm. Uh, we didn't uh, do that. Then you have to be careful with the features, of course. You like some waving. But do you expect that this kind of modeling the spiral arm is going to reduce your uncertainty? Or because at the end you are working with, in some sense, with average <coughs> values. In some sense, also you are including the larger, largest uncertainty in your bracketing. Or I don't know. Uh, that's a good question. I don't, I don't know. It might both ways. I mean, it depends on. I, I don't have a feeling of how uncertain is the is the is the spiral structure of our galaxy. Do you have a feeling for that? Because of course, if I just use the best fit model of the paper yeah, from Valdo or something, then it's, uh, it might reduce. But I, I'm not sure how certain this is. Yeah. So I, I would say it can go both ways. But it's an interesting question. So uh, and another question I have is, for instance, there are these models like the, the one from Lisa Randall, this double disk dark matter, in which you have the halo of dark matter and then plus a uh, disk light yeah. dark matter halo. Do you, have you tried to... I didn't to play around with that. Because in those they are arguing that it's the cause of the dinosaur extinction, because they move the... Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I know the... <laughs> from the Earth cloud. I know the yeah. um, So what... I mean, if you are interested in, in that, you, local methods are probably the best way uh, to go because they, they can distinguish in principle a, a more concentrated uh, distribution of dark matter towards the galactic center as opposed to a, 
in local scales basically isotropic or, or constant density of the, of the halo. Here, uh, so we didn't analyze any kind of these models, but I, I would fear that here we don't have uh, enough precision to tell apart or constrain or mm -hmm. But that, uh, there, I mean, the, the thing to do would be to use Gaia data on local stars to try to tell apart these by the way, I mean, do we know why sometimes, I mean, a bar is developed in the galaxies and other times not? Yeah, I'm not a, an expert on, on, on simulation of galaxies, but these bars are also developed in, in, uh, in, uh, in simulations of, of galaxies, also with the, with the rotation pattern and, and so on. But more than this, I don't think I can. Mm -hmm. More questions? So I guess if there are no more, we thank Miguel for this.